Evolutionary phenomena are often summarized in spindle diagrams, like this one. The seven little pictures at the top signify the extant classes of vertebrates. Jawless fishes, cartilaginous fishes, bony fishes, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. The lower silhouettes stand for the two extinct classes of armored fishes. The spindle-like shapes show in their length when the fossils of a given class appear, and in their breadth how many families the class includes at one time or another. The scale on the left marks the geologic eras and periods from below to above. The morphological affinities are obvious. For instance, fish, amphibian, reptile is an organic sequence. The manifest relation of one class to another is the meaning of the thin sideways branching lines. In other words, these lines represent thoughts. The spindles represent perceptions, or at any rate, the interpretation of perceptions as fossils. Contrary to popular belief, thoughts or concepts are more real than perceptions. This issue was dealt with in the presentation on epistemology. Together, perceptions and concepts constitute reality. Question. How does one class emerge out of another? Where are the transitional forms? Here is a close-up of a part of what was shown in the previous diagram. Again, the transitional specimens are missing. Even those nice solid spindles turn out to have gaps when you zoom in on them. Wherever you look, the entire phylogenetic tree consists altogether of missing links. The dotted lines show relations that are real and essential, but do not appear as fossils. and so on. All right, what about the transition from fish to tetrapods? It proceeds from Eusthenopteron, which is clearly still a fish, to Pederpes, an evident tetrapod. The changes are not simply linear, but you can see a relatedness. Better said, you have to think the relatedness. For here too there are many specimens within each type, but nothing visible between the types. Even the vaunted fossil record of the evolution of horse forms, probably the clearest fossil sequence there is, consists of discrete steps, each of which is represented by numerous like fossils. The sequence of the skulls shown here is roughly chronological, and even though the second half of this skull series is probably not a direct lineage, you could see the skulls as stills, single frames from a moving picture. But unlike a video file, the fossil record offers numerous copies of selected frames, and the other pictures, which must be supplied in imagination as transitions, are again missing. That is because an animal species has a group individuality, as mentioned in the presentation about the kingdoms of nature. 
the particular members of this species are its organs. The overarching being of all horse species, in turn, is a group being of group beings. The individual species are its organs and the footprints of its evolution. Speaking of footprints, the extremities seem to be out of order in this picture. In principle, the solution can be found in the fundamental epistemological work The Philosophy of Spiritual Activity by Rudolf Steiner. In the first appendix, he explains that the world of perceptions by itself is discontinuous and actually unreal, whereas the perceptual world pervaded by concepts is continuous. Most animal or plant groups do not develop gradually, but appear with their distinctive characteristics and retain them without fundamental changes for the duration of their existence. Look up most recent common ancestor, and you will find lengthy speculations clothed as certainty, but never a single real example of any common ancestor of two or more species. Despite strong motivation, no one has ever found a species that is a common ancestor of more recent species. And why might that be? Evidently, the common ancestor moves outside the region documented by fossils. Its trace shows up in those seemingly prosaic lines connecting the bases of the spindles. The nodes where other lines branch off indicate where the common ancestor casts out the animal forms. Who is that? Who is the bearer of the continuity of evolution all the way to man of today? The hominid series is discontinuous like all the rest. But unlike any other evolutionary sequence, this one run, runs backward, as noted in the second installment. If we are to take the term evolution seriously, meaning an unfolding, then there must have been a previous involution. The archetype was in a purely spiritual state, as divine creative thought. It descended by stages to a bodily constitution, fine at first, then eventually hardening to the point of leaving fossil traces. Hardening comes from the astral body, curtailing the ether body, to use the terms introduced in the presentation on the members of man's being. In animals, this process predominates. In man, the eye curtails the astral allowing a continuing suppleness. At first, the animal forms condense only temporarily within the world man. Typogenesis. With their hardening comes their independent reproduction. Typostasis. Then they die out. Typolysis. The process is the same for animal groups as for individual man, birth, maturity, death. Hence, of all the species that ever materialized, between 99% and 99.9% .9 are estimated to be extinct. 
All of this happens within the life sphere bestowed on the earth by the sun in the distant past. A mother offers up her body, sacrifices her own life forces for the birth and growth of the child. Where is the motherhood of the earth? To what does she give birth? Over geologic time, the rock crust shows hardening, fixation, and cooling. Those are the signs of death. In direct proportion to the increasing symptoms of death, during a certain phase in the evolution of the earth, the first plant life begins to unfold. Out of the fading body of the earth mother, a new, higher life emerges. And after the great extinctions at the end of the Cretaceous period, the fullness of birds, insects, and mammals arises. The surrender of a lower form of existence makes possible the life of a higher one. Here is a photograph of the original animal-human ancestor. Rudolf Steiner made this as part of a training method for painters. The method involves treating each color in keeping with its special character so that the shapes arise as a result of the inherent color dynamics. In other words, the painter does not start with a mental image. Rather, the qualitative lawfulness of a particular sequence of colors gives rise to surprising images such as this one of specific realities underlying the world of beings. Here is one of many attempts by Gerard Wagner to practice this exercise. Wagner repeated the painting again and again, systematically varying one of the first colors in the sequence, namely the warm yellow. This changes the behavior of all subsequent colors and thus modifies the resulting image. In the next step, Wagner broke the purity of the yellow shown here by mixing in a tiny bit of violet. Here is the result. The yellow has grown a little heavier. Consequently, the blue can no longer find a home in the yellow, but separates out, suggesting the separation of the plant kingdom from the original symbiosis. The more the yellow densifies, the more it expels the other colors, which populate the surrounding world instead. Meanwhile, the central being develops clearer contours. Thus the world of color itself offers a hint as to how animal forms hardened out of the flowing and evolving all being. Here is just a sampling of the further stages.